All right, so on this table, you are going to fill out our, um, it's like a summary of our immune response. Okay, and I'm gonna fill in actually two of the boxes for you right now to kind of get you a, a head start here. So this section is gonna be our first line of defense. And this is gonna be our second line of defense. Okay, so think about what do we call the type of immunity that has their first line and second line of defense, right? And then what do we have over here? And just give it your best guess. We'll go over it together in about a minute and a half. Oh, yeah, I'm going to try and hunt down this student real quick. So pardon me while you see my internet browser instead of the Word document. Let me see if I can find this person. All right, so for those of you that have just joined us, we've got the exam review part one sheet open and we're trying to use our brains to, to fill out as much as we can. All right. So let's go ahead and start walking through this. Let me scooch my computer up so I can write on it a little better. Okay, so what are the two different parts of our immune response? Good, Nellie, yes. So non-specific and specific, perfect. So which side is non-specific gonna go on? Is it gonna be the top left box or the top right box? Yes, good job, y'all. Okay, good. So I'm gonna put non-specific. You know, kind of abbreviate writing is much larger than typing. Um, but also remember that this is called our innate immunity as well. Because on the exam, I tend to go back and forth. I'm trying to be consistent, but just make sure you know that uh, the uh, non-specific immune response is the same thing as our innate immunity. And so then our other one is called our specific immune response. And this is going to also be called our adaptive response. All right. So can somebody tell me what are the three big categories that our first line of defenses fall into? Remember, these first lines of defense are at the surface of our body, and the main purpose is to keep pathogens out. Hey, there you go. Man, y'all are fast typers. Good. So we're going to have, and I'm going to be abbreviating here, y'all, just because I don't have much space, physical, chemical, and mechanical. And the physical, that's the same thing as like structural. Yes, so remember, um, there's the handout I posted on Blackboard, my in-person class, we did it in person, um, that it has that table where I put a bunch of terms and you had to divide them into 
whether it's a physical component, chemical, or mechanical. So definitely review that. My in-person students, I think I posted that in your Blackboard as well, but I'm not 100%. So the physical structures are gonna be like our skin, because remember our skin is you know, many layers um, of tightly packed cells, right? So it's very hard for little microbes to wiggle their way through or penetrate through the skin. Um, we also shed our outer layer of skin um, every so often, so that gets rid of things. And of course, it's pretty dry. Um, it's relatively hot, right? It's exposed to the sun a lot. Um, so it's not a very um, hospitable environment for microbes. Um, and then the other two physical structures are going to be mucous membranes and um, our ciliary escalators. Yep, good, and exactly, thank you, Nathan. So we also have keratinocytes, which um, produce keratin. Um, so that's also going to prevent microbes from being able to, to hang out on our skin. Staphylococcus, um, as a genus, they tend to be um, halophilic or haloduric, and so they can withstand the salt, right, because we sweat, and so we get a pretty salty environment and most organisms can't handle that either. But as we're starting to talk about in labs, staphylococci um, are able to withstand heat and salt and all sorts of other stuff. They're a real pain, uh, but they tend to cause the, a lot of skin infections. All right, and so with chemicals, remember that's gonna be things um, like lysozyme and uh, lactoferrin, um, basically chemicals that are in our body and also molecules. I like to use chemicals and molecules interchangeably in this context. Um, things that are going to prevent bacterial growth um, or really most other types of microbes as well. And then with our mechanical, that's just going to be movements, flushing movements. So when we, you know, kind of like our, our eyes water up and we blink real fast, right? We're trying to flush things out. Same with urinating, defecating, vomiting, so on and so forth. Those are all mechanical movements of us trying to flush out our system and any pathogens that may have gotten into our body. So make sure that you do review that handout, okay? And that you understand why each of the words in the word bank goes in the appropriate category. All right, any questions on our first line of defense? Mucus itself would be um, chemical. I would put sweat under chemical as well because it's the components of sweat and mucus that allow it to, um, to not be hospitable to pathogens. Let's see. All right, hold on. I have a couple people emailing me trying to get into the review. So let me copy that link real quick and send it to them. Sorry, y'all. Give me one second. Um, how do I even do that? Hold on a second. Um, here's the link. Okay, hold on, y'all. I'm sorry. Oh, she sent that to me on Remind. Ah. So go ahead and fill out the second line of defense and try just going off your memory. Try not to use your notes. Um, as you can see, I was just crammed for space. So it's the seven different components of our second line of defense. That's what I want you to fill in there and try and just use your brain. This will take me just 30 seconds once I, once I get signed in. All right, hold on one second. I do, I heard the noise. I'm trying to just post this real quick. Oh, just got rid of the, the link. Oh, Chelsea. Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea. Oh my gosh, I can't do this fast enough. The pressure. Okay, hold on y'all, I'm really sorry. Okay, 
posted as an announcement as well. Okay, back to y'all, I apologize. Okay. You know, um, uh, let's see, I just saw Nathan's question. Oh, no, we answered that, I'm sorry. Okay, I misread Nathan's question. Okay, so can somebody start naming for me some of our second lines of defense? Ooh, hey, y'all were ready for that. It's like y'all know me. Good, okay, so let's start with what Carrie said. So fever, what is the more sciencey term for fever? Yes, good. Pyrexia. All right. So it's good to know both. Good. Pyrexia. Perfect. So fever. So we're going to come back and talk about each of these here in just a second. Um, so yes, good, Nathan. So phagocytosis, and we know that's one of my favorite processes. So we definitely want to have that one down pat. Um, interferons. Man, I think a lot of my favorite. I have a lot of favorite topics, don't I? I feel like I constantly tell you, all this is my favorite and then I move on to another unit. I'm like, this is my favorite. Okay, so interferons, good. Uh, inflammation and NK cells and net, man, look at y'all, good. I'm just gonna start filling things in. Um, inflammation. There we go, good. My, I actually forgot complement system earlier when I was making this, I felt like a, like a turd. Okay, so we're missing one. What have I missed? Interferons, phagocytosis inflammation, that's there we go, Maya, for the win, antimicrobial peptides, good. I'm just gonna call those anti-peptides, perfect. <laughs> Sorry for the sloppy handwriting. Okay, so let's, let's kind of review some of these. So let's start with interferons, because that's what we talked about first. What type of cell is going to produce interferons? There's a special type of cell that's going to release these. Good, an infected cell, exactly. So this cell already knows that it's doomed. And it is going to essentially sound the alarm so all the neighboring cells know that there's an attack. Okay, and so these are normally associated with viral infections, but there are a couple interferons that do deal with other pathogens, but essentially what, what happens is with virally infected cells, okay, they produce the interferons that then get released out into the environment. Other neighboring cells are going to detect these interferons, and in response, they produce proteins called AVPs. And AVP stands for antiviral protein. And so the uninfected cell is gonna like mass produce these AVPs, and it's gonna serve as like a little army, like it waits near the plasma membrane. And if a virus tries to enter the cell, it basically, for lack of a better word, it attacks it. it. It makes it so that it can't uncoat and do biosynthesis and all of those things. So it prevents the viral replication cycle from even happening, which is pretty snazzy. And then as is mentioned in the PowerPoint, it does, we've actually just recently um, found that interferons can also be taken up by infected cells and it causes apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So again, it's trying to shut down the viral replication cycle before the viruses lyse the host cell. Okay, so um, interferons are mainly, their primary role is gonna be to warn neighboring uninfected cells to make those AVPs so that they can stand guard. Okay, any questions on interferons? All right, so I'm just going to move left. So with um, natural killer cells, so these little boogers are um, kind of like, I always think of, um, yes, Nathan, that's exactly right. They're interfering with the viral replication process. That's exactly right. 
So with our natural killer cells, they are kind of like the police, I think, of the you know innate immune response because they're kind of going around just checking out and making sure cells are okay. And so they'll go up to a self cell and they'll be like, hey, you good? And then they will determine if the self cell is good. And if it is, it lets it go on its merry way. If it is not, it targets the cell for apoptosis. And so how does the natural killer cell know whether or not a self cell is healthy or not? What is it, what is it assessing? <laughs> Good, MHC1s, yes, because remember, all self cells have MHC1 on their surface, and usually a lot, a lot of them, hundreds, hundreds of them. And it turns out that when there's normally either a viral, uh, viral infection or even um, cancer, the number of MHC1s are going to drastically decrease or disappear altogether. Okay, and so by assessing the number of MHC1s on the self cell surface, it can gauge whether or not it's infected. And so remember, natural killer cells have two important enzymes that they release in order to kill the infected cell. And that's going to be perforin and granzyme. So I'm going to spell perforin because I feel like I say it wrong. That's it. I feel like I say it with P-E-R-F-E-R, perforin. I don't know why I can't say that. But essentially, perfor. now I'm going to overanalyze my speech. Uh, essentially, perforin uh, is going to punch a hole in the membrane of the self cell. And that is going to allow granzyme to get in, which is going to just wreak havoc on the self cell and cause it to die thus stopping uh, viral infection in its tracks and preventing um, mitosis, which is what's happening with, uh, with cancerous cells. With cancerous cells, it's unregulated mitosis. They just keep dividing over and over and over again. And so by killing the cell, we're shutting down that process as well. Awesome. Okay, so next up are going to be nets. What type of immune cell casts a net. Neutrophils, exactly. That's what the N stands for in net. Um, and essentially, the neutrophil is going to sacrifice itself in order to trap the pathogen. And it literally forms a net. Okay. So it's like in some of those old like pirate movies, you see where like the people get caught in the nets. Um, they, the neutrophils use their own DNA, okay, um, which makes these net-like structures because it has all this chromatin wrapped around it, um, and it associates all these antimicrobial enzymes with the DNA chromatin net structure, and so essentially, the, the net is going to blast a hole in its, I'm sorry, the neutrophil is going to blast a hole in itself and release that net. So it dies in the process, but it then releases all of that DNA net structure and it covers the pathogen. And then all of these antimicrobial enzymes are going to go and chop it all up into little pieces and eliminate it. So it's pretty snazzy, but this is a relatively new thing. I hadn't heard of it until until relatively recently. So it's pretty snazzy. All right, any questions on nets or natural killer cells? Okay, so moving along, um, inflammation. So what is the main purpose? Oh, I'm getting into some of my little boxes down here. Okay, I'm not gonna ask the purpose question. Uh, we're just gonna talk about the process of inflammation. Okay, so with inflammation, I always forget what I make. <laughs> Uh, so with inflammation, um, remember, actually, y'all tell me, what kind of cells are going to initiate inflammation? Yes, exactly. Mast cells. Okay. Mast cells are found in connective tissue. So when something penetrates the skin, those mast cells are alerted. They're going to release lots of histamine. Good, Karen, you didn't even have to ask that one. Uh, yes, they're going to release histamine, 
And that is going to trigger what? It starts with a V. Histamine triggers what? There we go. Good, Maya. Vasodilation. So the blood vessels are going to dilate, and that's going to allow blood and phagocytes and nutrients and oxygen and all these things to move more rapidly towards the site of infection. Okay? And so what's going to happen is now that the, the vessels are dilated, the phagocytes are going to travel down the blood vessel because they're trying to get to the site of infection where the pathogens are. And so that little, I, I envision it like them literally marching down the blood vessel and that's called margination. So margination sounds like marching. Go with it guys. And so margination is one of the keywords you need to know um, associated with inflammation. But also, this vasodilation um, allows there to be these little gaps in between the cells that are lining the blood vessels. And so once the phagocytes get to the site of infection, they can squeeze through and get to the pathogens and start doing phagocytosis. So what is that process called when the phagocytes are squeezing through, um, in, through the blood vessels to get to? There, we, there you go. Didn't even have to finish. Diapodesis. Yes, definitely know these terms, y'all. Definitely. Good. So again, mast cells release histamine, which triggers vasodilation, which is going to um, result in margination and diapodesis. Once the phagocytes are there with the pathogens, they are going to round them up and clear that infection. And eventually, there'll be tissue repair and things like that as well. Awesome. All right, I need to speed this up a little bit. Okay, antimicrobial peptides, we don't know much about them. They're still a relatively new development. It's a very small chain of amino acids. Anytime you see the word peptide, you need to think of amino acids and proteins because peptide bonds are what join amino acids together. So these antimicrobial peptides are short chains of amino acids that fold in such a way that they can insert themselves into the phospholipid bilayer. And that's going to allow the membrane to become leaky and obviously the cell will die. So that's, that's really all you've got to know about antimicrobial peptides, that they're small chains of amino acids, they insert into the membrane, and they're a second line of defense. Because that's really all we know. All right, I think that just leaves me with pyrexia and complement system. So with pyrexia, remember pyrogens are going to get that party started. And there are endogenous pyrogens and exogenous pyrogens. And normally it's going to be an exogenous pyrogen, which means it's a pyrogen from outside of the cell that's going to come in and it's going to alert the body that, hey, there's a problem. So LPS, which is part of the gram-negative cell wall, is um, a very good example because remember, y'all, endotoxins trigger a fever, right? Well, what's an endotoxin? LPS. So this is how we're kind of connecting some of these ideas. So uh, the endotoxin, which is LPS, is going to get into the body. The body is like, uh-uh, you don't belong here. And so our immune system is going to detect it. It's going to release interleukins, uh, which are going to eventually travel um, through the body, and we're going to um, cause the hypothalamus to get reset. Remember, prostaglandins are involved in that process. They're essentially tricking the hypothalamus into thinking that our body is too cool. We need to heat things up. And so what do we do to help crank up the heat inside of our body? What are some things that we do? Exactly, shivering, right? Because what happens as our body shivers, right? We're increasing the motion. And so um, when you increase the motion of molecules, right, heat is generated. And then yes, good, vasoconstriction. So we're trying to kind of like reduce the amount of blood flow that's going to like the extremities because that's where we lose a lot of heat. Right? You often hear people say that their, their fingers or their toes are really cold, right? Because we lose heat at our extremities. So we're trying to um, decrease the amount of blood flow to that area. And then, yes, we um, release uh, things from the thyroid in order to 
um, increased metabolism. Because remember y'all, with any reaction that's happening in our cells, all of these reactions just naturally release heat as a byproduct. So the more metabolism we're doing, then the more heat we're generating. So and remember, does anybody remember, what do we call it uh, when our fever breaks? It is called crisis. Yeah, and I still don't know why. So if anybody does know why it's called crisis, let me know. But once you know things are under control, the fever breaks, and basically the opposite starts to happen, right? Uh, we're going to quit vasoconstriction, so vasodilation is going to happen. Um, we're going to start sweating, right? Because we're, again, we're trying to cool down at this point. So it's very interesting that crisis you know, sounds so bad, but it's normally good when our fever breaks. Okay, I, uh, complement system. <laughs> All right, y'all. So remember, um, the complement system, think of it as like a domino effect. So there are a series of complement proteins. We sketched them out in class. Um, there's like 30 of them, but we were only concerned with about nine of them. So make sure you do study that little picture that I drew in the content videos or in class. Um, so once one complement protein gets activated, it goes and activates the next protein, which activates the next protein, which activates the next proteins. And so um, the end result is always three things. What are they? Y'all tell me. What are the three outcomes of the complement system? Good, inflammation. What else? Cytolysis, and what should you, ooh, good, and opsonization, awesome. So no matter which complement pathway gets activated, because there's three, we're gonna review them in a minute. Um, no matter which pathway gets activated, you're gonna see inflammation, cytolysis, and opsonization. So cytolysis is, uh, is gonna happen because some of the complement proteins are going to essentially get together and poke a hole or form a pore in the pathogen's membrane. What is that pore structure called? There's three letters. MAC, good. And that stands for membrane attack complex. Okay, that's what's going to cause cytolysis. Okay, so remember there are three different complement pathways, classical, um, lectin and alternative, and I will include some of those tomorrow. We're going to do a review Kahoot because we're going to review the microbial mechanisms and vaccines and epidemiology tomorrow, but I'm also going to have a Kahoot that kind of encompasses all of this stuff. So I'm going to test you on the details of the complement pathway tomorrow. So if you have time, review that before then. Um, but just remember, no matter which pathway or what the trigger is, um, you have those same three outcomes. And that's going to be why a lot of pathogens target the complement system. They have their own little weapons, little virulence factors, um, specifically proteases that are going to target complement proteins. Because a protease, I'm going to type that in the chat. Remember, when you see a name like that, right, ASE means it's an enzyme. So if you look before that, Prot means that the enzyme is targeting proteins, okay? Uh, the three pathways again. Oh, they're going to be classical, lectin, and alternative. No, I'm not sure if you hit enter too soon, but I'm not sure what you're saying. We didn't. Oh, my favorite one. Goodness gracious. How did I skip that? Okay, phagocytosis. You definitely want to know this, so let's run through it. So step one, the phagocyte must hunt down the pathogen. And so that occurs um, via chemotaxis. So the pathogen, as it's going about its merry little way, it is naturally, right, doing its own metabolism. And so it's naturally releasing these little chemical byproducts out into the environment. Well, that is going to be the scent that the phagocytes pick up. And so they, they literally just chase the pathogen around. And so that's step one, find it via chemotaxis. Then it has to grab hold of it. So remember, the TLRs, the toll-like receptors on the phagocyte, are going to attach to the PAMP on the pathogen. Okay. 
So TLR on the phagocyte is going to attach to the PAMP on the pathogen. Okay. And so once it grabs hold of it, now it can start to ingest the pathogen. And it does so, um, it uses endocytosis, but remember the pathogen has to essentially like tackle the pathogen, right? It's got to wrap its arms around the pathogen in order to bring it inside of the cell. And so those little extensions that it forms to quote unquote hug or tackle the pathogen are called pseudopods. Okay, so pseudopods, I'll type that in the chat too. Pseudopods are associated with ingestion. So once the pathogen has been endocytosed or ingested, what do we call that initial vesicle? Good, the phagosome, okay? So the first one is the phagosome, but remember the problem that right off the bat that the phagocyte has is this phagosome mainly has a neutral pH, right? Because in our body, the pH is neutral, but we need the lysosome, my favorite organelle, to come in and do its thing, right? But the lysosome requires an acidic pH, right? So there's a problem there. This teeny tiny lysosome and this big old phagosome have different pHs. So in order to decrease the pH of the phagosome, uh, it acquires these little proton pumps that are pumping protons into the phagosome to start decreasing that pH. Because the next step is the merging of the phagosome and the lysosome. And we call that vesicle the phagolysosome. Exactly. Yep. And so at this point, those hydrolytic enzymes that were in the lysosome are exposed to the pathogen. It destroys the pathogen mercilessly. And then what happens? We have just the leftover residual stuff, the stuff that couldn't be broken down. So now the vesicle is referred to as the residual body. So it just has all the residual stuff in it. So at that point, normally it just releases all that digested stuff out into the cell. And that's the end of the story. Except when we're talking about our third line of defense. So let's go up and, and finish this table real quick. So our specific immune response, also called our adaptive or our acquired immune response, which you never know it by how I wrote that right there, would you? Um, has two branches or two arms. What are the two branches of our specific immune response? Good, humoral is one and then cellular is the other. Good, humoral and cellular. Awesome. So under each one, I want you to write the type of cells that are associated with it. So what type of cells are associated with our humoral response? Good, nice job, Nathan. So here we're gonna have our B cells. Uh oh, I have done something wonky. My arm hit something, hold on. Sorry about that, y'all. Okay, let's see if I can unclick that. There we go, good. So B cells and then T cells. So since we're already over here on this adaptive immune response, I want us to take a minute because I meant to make a little Venn diagram, but I forgot. Let's write out the characteristics of our adaptive immune response compared to our innate immune response. So do I have any room on this paper? No, I don't. Let's see, how do I, can I insert a blank page? How do I do that? So it's gonna move all my tables. Hey, oh, okay. So we're gonna come down here. All right, so we're gonna have um, non-specific and specific. Because I try to keep my number of test questions pretty low. And so comparing and contrasting things like non-specific and specific immunity save me space. I can test y'all on a lot of information in just one question. Same thing with you know, um, exotoxins and endotoxins, right? Lots of information, one question. All right, so which of these um, are present at birth? You can put N or S, non-specific or specific. Good, so non-specific is 
uh, present at birth. And therefore we say that it has an immediate or even a short um, response time. So then let's contrast that. So with a specific immune response, this is a delayed response, right? And that's because it's acquired. So acquired over time. So it has a delayed response because it has to, the pathogen has to get through the surface of the body, past our second lines of defense, and then activate those memory cells. And it's like, oh, wait, hey, have I even seen you before? No, wait, let me activate some B cells, activate some T cells, make some memory cells, make some plasma cells, right? It takes a lot of time. Whereas inflammation, phagocytosis, all of those are always ready and they are activated immediately as soon as there is danger. Okay, so immediate versus delayed. I think the name kind of gives it away, right? Non-specific is not specific for the pathogen. So I'm just gonna put not picky, just so I'm not being too redundant. Phagocytosis is phagocytosis regardless if we're dealing with Ebola, COVID, or E. coli. It doesn't matter. Our non-specific immune responses are identical no matter what. Good, general broad spectrum, I like that. Very, very good because they're not picky, right? They're gonna be general because they don't care what the pathogen is. But our specific immune response is picky. We have a different set of antibodies for E. coli, a different set of antibodies for COVID, a different antibodies for, uh, I don't know, salmonella. All right, what else? Good. So our specific immune response has the memory component. Non-specific does not, because again, it doesn't care what the pathogen is. It doesn't need to remember. But as we know, our second line of defense isn't always as effective as we'd like. Okay. Does anybody else have anything that they want to add to this? If we think of anything, we can always come back. Okay, and of course, know the, the components. So no phagocytosis and inflammation, all of those are over here. Know that B cells and T cells are associated with specific. Okay, so let's fill out this second part. And so we've already kind of gone through, um, through some of this table, okay? So we're gonna go through this kind of fast. What is the purpose of pyrexia, right? We're just trying to increase our body temp. Okay, and why is that? We're hoping to kill the pathogen, right? Because a lot of them can't withstand higher temperatures. So we're essentially trying to hope that we can stand the heat better than they can. That's it, should say kill pathogen. All right, with, um, with inflammation, what's the purpose of inflammation? going to be to wall off or kind of quarantine the pathogen. Okay, and that's one reason that swelling and things happen is because, yeah, we're trying to immobilize and we're trying to prevent the pathogen from spreading throughout the body. Okay, and so by being able to essentially quarantine the pathogen, that just means that the phagocytes can get to them and kill them before, exactly, before we actually get an infection or hit that diseased state. So we're just trying to cut them off at the limb. All right, um, let's see. With interferons, right? We've already kind of said they're trying to interfere with viral replication. And for this test, I'm gonna focus on the, the viral part of it. Because that's what they're mainly for, so after virally infected cells. Okay, so it's interfere and even prevent, right? Because the goal is for the uninfected cells to make those AVPs so they're already ready. All right, so the purpose of the complement system is going to be those three outcomes, okay? So opsonization, inflammation, and then cytolysis via the MAC complex. 
our antimicrobial peptides, I'm just gonna write anti here, those were to um, essentially poke holes. I'm gonna put leaky, leaky plasma membrane. And then of course, we're talking about for the pathogen. I don't even know how I made that little scribble right there. Who have I left out? Okay, natural killer cells. Their purpose is they're kind of like surveillance, right? So they're, they're cruising around and assessing everybody. And then of course they will eliminate infected cells. And then nets, really it's the same thing. They are straight up killing the, kill the pathogen trap it and kill it. All right, do we have any questions on our second lines of defense? Of all the things I talk about in this entire class in terms of like big content topic, I love second lines of defense. Interferons, phagocytosis, complement, all of it, I love it. So if I love it, you're gonna see a lot of it. So please make sure you're familiar with these. Any questions? Okay, so let's go through this third line of defense really quickly. All right, so again, compare and contrast. This is the easy way for me um, to ask you lots of information or test you on lots of information in very few questions. Nathan, is inflammation typically localized? Yes, yes it is. Okay, so we've already answered the first row up above. So our humoral, Immunity focuses on B cells, and our cellular immunity focuses on T cells. And we call them B cells and T cells because of where these types of cells mature in the body. So where do B cells mature? Hint, it starts with a B. There we go, good, bone marrow. And what about our T cells? Good, the thymus, perfect, okay. So think back to that diagram that y'all have to know, or diagrams, plural, I should say. Um, think about those diagrams that you have to know because you're gonna see part of them on your test. What do B cells recognize? You're both right, stuff on the outside, I'm getting to that later and antigens, that's true, that is true. But our B cells are going to recognize intact pathogen. Because remember y'all, um, pathogens, I'm sorry, B cells have antibodies all on their surface. The B cell receptor is an antibody or lots of antibodies, hundreds and hundreds of them. And so antibodies are going to recognize the entire pathogen. Now, yes, specifically the antigenic region, but there no phagocytosis has to happen for a B cell to detect its antigen. Okay, so they we say that B cells recognize an intact or undigested pathogen. It recognizes the entire thing, and it's going to phagocytose the entire thing. Okay. So in contrast, though, if you think back to that diagram, remember that in order for a T cell to be activated, the dendritic cell had to phagocytose it and then present only the antigen, right? And so that's going to be what our T cells recognize. They're going to recognize the antigenic peptide, which is also called the antigenic fragment, aka digested pathogen. I don't know if I'm allowed to write in this gray space or not. Oh, hey, I can't. Oh, and then it deletes it. Well, that's mean. Okay, so B cells recognize the entire pathogen and then phagocytose it. Because T cells don't do any phagocytosing themselves, they have to recognize a pathogen that has already been phagocytosed and digested. Okay, so B cell recognizes the intact pathogen and T cells recognize digested pathogen when that antigen has been presented on an MHC2 molecule. All right, so once B cells are activated, what do they release? What is our end goal here with stimulating our humoral response? 
antibodies. Good. Good. So remember, um, on an exam, okay, if I say what type of cell releases antibodies, you can either say an activated B cell or plasma cells. Okay, I'm not trying to be tricky, but activated B cells are what differentiate into plasma making cells. And so in other classes, like as you go into nursing school, a lot of times people don't get that picky and say a plasma cell. They normally just say a B cell because that B cell had to be activated in order to differentiate into a plasma cell. Okay. So I will normally say plasma cell, but I just, in, in the chance that I say activated B cell, that is fine because activated B cells become plasma cells, but the end result is the same. They release antibodies. What do T cells release? I'm going to go ahead and just kind of talk as I fill it in because we're running out of time. I'm sorry, I babble a lot. Cytokines, yes. So remember on the handouts, um, you're going to see interleukin a whole lot. And let me put that in the chat. And um, an interleukin is a type of cytokine. But the only time I'm going to be picky with you knowing the word interleukin is for fevers. Because in the little sketch that I did in class, I specifically talk about interleukins and their role in fever. Okay. Anything else, just worry about calling it a cytokine. Okay, whenever it's about T cells and what do T cells release? Cytokines. Okay. All right. So, B cells, what are they targeting? And this is where I think Nathan mentioned it before stuff hiding inside, okay, and stuff hiding outside, that whole idea. Okay. So, humoral um, are B cells, right, which are eventually going to release antibodies. Antibodies circulate throughout the body. So, they are going to target extracellular pathogens, those that are outside of individual cells because antibodies can't cross into cells. They're too, they're too big. Well, that's not necessarily true. They're just, we don't need that to happen. So they can't, they can't get in. Our T cells, right? Think about our cytotoxic T cells, right? They go around looking for viral infections. And so they are gonna be intracellular pathogens is what our T cells are looking for viruses, things that have gotten inside of a cell and are replicating. There are a few bacterial species like chlamydia that are also intracellular parasites, and so our T cells would target, would target chlamydia as well. But for the most part, bacteria are targeted by the humoral response. All right, and so um, the last part of this table, what do B cells differentiate into? Uh, plasma cells and memory cells, memory B cells specifically. And T cells actually differentiate into multiple things, and we're only going to talk about three of them here. Uh, T helper cells, technically the word helper should be in subscript, but I haven't been that picky in PowerPoints, but T helper cells and then cytotoxic T cells, and they also have uh, memory T cells as well. So remember the helper cells are going to help activate our B cells, and then the cytotoxic T cells are going to be what actually goes after those intracellular pathogens. All right, any questions on this worksheet? All right, y'all are doing great. So let's go ahead and move on to this one. All right, so I was gonna give y'all some time to do this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of talk and think out loud while we do it. But I do suggest y'all for all of these, um, uh oh, my battery's gonna die. Crud. Uh, hold on, y'all. Um, I do suggest, though, for all of these, that you um. Uh oh, here. Ah. In panic. Hold on, I can't find the like thing. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. I do suggest that you print these out and be able to complete these handouts from memory without your notes before the exam. 
Okay, so there's a lot of material. Um, but if you can do these handouts without your notes, you're in pretty good shape. All right, so here we go. So we have two heavy chains. Okay, that are these two inside green chains. And then the blue chains, I'm only gonna label one of them. These two blue chains are the light chains. The dark region of both the heavy chains and the light chains, so I'm gonna kind of draw it like this. So the, the dark blue and the dark green, we call these the constant regions. And then these light portions, I'm only, again, only drawing an arrow to the blue, but it's for the, the heavy chains too. The light green and the light blue, these make up the variable regions. And the area specifically where the antigen is gonna bind, that is called the paratope. So the paratope is part of the variable region. And ignore that black line. I couldn't get that black semicircle thing to go away. I don't know what that is. And then we have the double S's. Those are disulfide bridges. And that's gonna be what's holding this protein molecule together. Remember, antibodies are proteins. All right, so our five classes of antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. And remember, we don't really know what IgD does, so we're not worried about class D. What was, which of these is the big antibody? It's a pentamer. Which one is that? Good, IgM. Okay, I'm just going to write mega here. Okay, so it has a role, a role in agglutination because remember, agglutination is essentially rounding up all the antigens, bringing them to one place. It causes clumping in the lab. We're going to do a, a, a lab about this, and your, your serum will clump up because it's bringing all the, all the antigens and antibodies together in one area. And so because IgM is so big, it can grab more pathogens and round them up faster. All right, which of these is found in secretions? Yes, good. So this one is offering protection to a newborn. And then um, IgG is the one that can cross the placenta, offering protection to a fetus. And then IgE, it has a role um, in allergic responses. Any questions about the structure of an antibody or the, the main role that we're concerned about with these different classes? IgM is also one of the, when during the primary response, when we're first encountering a pathogen for the very first time, IgM is typically one of the first antibodies released because it's so big. Again, it can go and round them up faster and try and, and clear them before we get rid of them. So IgM is one of the first made. Okay, I'm gonna step over two and three because it'll just take us too long, but this is basically me asking you to know your diagrams. Okay, take a second and Read the descriptions on the right and try and match them. All right, so we're going to start at the top one, two, three, four, five. All right, which of these recognizes and kill? Oh, that's not the right way to do this. Uh, which of these, one through five, one at the top, five at the bottom, is a helper cell? Which description actually has the word help in it? This one. So this a T helper cell, remember the virgin T cell is going to be activated when it recognizes the antigenic peptide on the MHC2 of the dendritic cells. Okay, and then once it becomes a, a helper cell, it goes and uh, releases cytokines, which are going to allow the activated B cell 
to differentiate and form plasma cells. All right, um, I am just gonna start at the top. For some reason, that's how my brain is working. Which one, A through E, is going to recognize and kill infected cells? And also cells that are non-self. Yes, our cytotoxic T cells. Sorry, I will call them T cells, not lymphocytes. Yes, good, David, E. Okay, this cell becomes activated when its immunoglobulins, AKA antibodies, bind to its specific epitope and they require assistance from helper cells to differentiate. Who needs help? This one is actually going to be B. B cells. Oh my gosh. Yes, that is number C. Letter C, oh God. Is it bedtime yet? Okay, because B cells are the only ones covered in antibodies. Remember, antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. All right, um, this cell is responsible for the enhanced secondary response. That's going to be our memory cells. Because remember, when our memory cells encounter their pathogen, they immediately divide and start making antibodies. That's why our secondary response is so much faster. And then um, this molecule, notice it doesn't say cell. So this is going to be our antibodies. They're made up of protein chains. That's the heavy chain and the light chain. Okay, and they interact with antigens. All right, so we will start on number five tomorrow, and then we will do the Kahoot and review um, vaccines and microbial mechanisms. But I have class right now, y'all, so I got to go. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope to see a lot of you tomorrow. Bye, y'all.